Hello, I'm Karen Christensen. I recorded this video conversation with Ray Oldenburg in 2012. I'd flown to Pensacola, Florida to meet him for the first time after corresponding with him for over 20 years and even working with him on the Encyclopedia of Community. As you'll see in here, the recording was a spur of the moment thing made on my phone as we talked over coffee. My idea that morning was that we'd do a proper video on some future occasion. I forgot all about this recording. Just weeks before Ray's death, over a decade later, I found it on a backup drive. I'm very happy indeed now to be able to introduce Ray Oldenburg, the author of The Great Good Place, celebrating his life, his work, and his good cheer. Ray, what type of place has the most potential to be a, a true third place? Uh, before Starbucks, before Caribou and the others, uh, coffee never really caught on here the way it did in England, for example. And, and that was, uh, by the way, the English have gone back to coffee, as I understand it, gotten mm -hmm. off of tea. And coffee is, is, uh, is solid. And as we discussed earlier, um, the libraries are capitalizing on this as a, uh, <coughs> as a place for people to gather and talk, in addition to, being the, you know, to having the older library functions. Uh, churches are more and more into this. Next, as I told you, next uh, week, no, next month, first week of next month, I'll meet with several clergymen who are very interested in, in this sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Well, you know, the bakery made a comeback, as, as, as we discussed. Yes. Uh, Panera's yes. Uh, works quite well. Have you heard of Tim Hortons in Canada? It's a chain, and a friend told me it's really popular as a gathering place. I would imagine that... Um, Bakeries would do better in the north, but that's just my suspicion based on where I grew up. Uh, my goodness, uh, you know, uh, jelly rolls and Bismarcks and bear claws and all that stuff. Very popular up in the colder climate. How about the big coffee chains like Starbucks or Lavasa, Costa Coffee, even Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's? I, I, I think there's always a limit on chains. Uh, for example, I've heard of uh, rather pricey subdivisions built around a, a Starbucks, and then Starbucks leaves, and they're in big trouble. The prices fall, and then, you know, it's a mess. Yeah. Uh, also, of course, Starbucks has em have employees with ambitions far beyond the community they're serving in, and, and so they, they're, they're not going to be part of your... Uh, uh, a friendly group uh, that you know outside of your own circle. They're, they're, they're here today and gone tomorrow. Also, <laughs> chains are rather bland. You've mm -hmm. seen one, seen them all, that kind of thing, you know. And, uh, a friend of mine uh, did a book on Starbucks and I think he visited well over 400 of them and concluded that they're not real third places because they don't have that core of regulars that meet there and talk there. Mm -hmm. What he found is that people who come there will talk, but they'll talk pretty much only to people they come in with. So it, it's, it doesn't have that basic feature of, of third places. And Starbucks doesn't really want people to linger a long time and use up space that uh, better paying customers will, will eventually come in and use, hopefully. Well, uh, but on the positive side, Starbucks has helped a lot to make us aware of the need for these places, although they don't really, in my mind, satisfy it. Some people say that we can have third places online using social media platforms. How do you feel about that? Now, as to the notion of virtual places, 
I uh, forget the name of the man because I forget everything, but uh, there, there was a fellow uh, some years ago who, who made popular the idea of a virtual third place, which I think is utter nonsense. Because if you look up the word virtual and, and if you take it seriously, it means that this virtual third place is the same in both essence and effect as a real third place, and that's just not true. Uh, there, there's, you know, to sit a, to sit a, alone in a darkened room, staring at a screen and, and putting in messages and receiving messages, it is not like being there. I did a an unpublished study of laughter one time, and. Uh, at that time, I was reading something that uh, said that the average American laughs about 15, 14, 15 times a day. Uh -huh. Well, we, we just exploded those statistics when it came to people. We, we looked at people, uh, groups of three, four, five, six, and up to eight, uh -huh. and the, the laughter far exceeded uh -huh. the, the, that, if that indeed was the norm. Um, and you, and uh, I, I don't see people rocking with laughter as they sit in front of a darkened screen. So that's just part of it, the laughter. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But the laughter, of course, uh, breeds camaraderie. Now, I think there's research, and I, I, I haven't gotten serious about this, but one of the predictions following the notion of virtual third places is that real uh, person-to-person -person contact would decline. The exact opposite has happened. They're, more, they're, they're, they're getting together more in conferences. The idea that they wouldn't have to travel, that's nonsense, they're traveling more than ever. Right. And, yeah, so I think, it, I, I think that pretty much tells the story that uh, uh, this is not a replacement that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, is email Good. I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go down to the post office. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 uh, it's very useful, but it shouldn't be confused with the third place. Plenty of people haven't experienced, uh, or really experienced, what you mean when you talk about third places, Ray. Can you tell us about some of the things that started you off on this quest of yours? What places did you have in mind? Well, okay, if you've looked at the book, my, my very first experience, I think I was four, maybe five, I think I was four. And um, I had three male cousins that used to uh, help take care of me. And they took me down to the uh, skating shack one time. And uh, when I say skating shack, I mean the warming shack at the edge of a skating Yeah. Yeah. Right. You skate for a while and it's cold and you want, when you get wet and you come in and, and uh, they have a pot-bellied stove in the middle and mm -hmm. it's, it's warm. And uh, people were so happy there and uh, that was my first real experience of uh, being in, 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 a, in a place where people were having so much fun in one another's presence. Then, as I got older, uh, I became one of the regulars at the local soda fountain. And at that time, school let out at exactly four o'clock, and several of us make a beeline for the drugstore and its soda fountain. And uh, we would have, in those days, a very elaborate Sunday for, Sunday for 15, cent, 15 cents. And we would... Uh, flirt with the girls there, play canasta there, and thankfully nobody minded. Uh, we, we weren't, uh, you know, the best paying customers for the place, but, but, you know, we paid our way. That was wonderful. And then, you know, when you get to be in high school in the upper couple of classes, you're welcome in a beer joint. They don't serve you beer, but uh, it's, it's, you, you can hang around uh, in, in what is really more an adult setting, and, and that was fun. And let's see, in uh, going off to college then, uh, my roommate and I found uh, Schulte's Bar in Mankato, Minnesota, and it was a talking bar, and we would go down there and talk. 
And that's where I learned from the older groups, from the older customers, to take my hands off a of beer. <laughs> my habit up to then had been to hold on to that bottle until it was empty. But uh, these guys would set the beer down, it lasted a long time, and I got used to that. So, uh, oh, Of course, then when I went overseas, I got used to uh, French cafes, which just wowed me. They're wonderful, wonderful places. Most of them having sidewalk seating. What about the physical setup that encourages the third place experience? If you go to Sweden, outdoor seating, uh, there is a, a steel railing between the auto traffic and the sidewalk. So that limits it. Now, in most French cafes, and I often wonder where they hide the chairs, but the more customers, the more they go out, out, out. Uh -huh. And they don't all face the street. No, they, people sit at tables mm -hmm. in, in a normal fashion. Um, I've seen it elsewhere. There is a street in D.C. that has some sidewalk cafes. I forget the name of it. But, uh, of course, Paris is just, it's the model. Yeah. It's the model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I've forgotten so much of this. I, I, uh, I think I outlined seating arrangements in, in, a, in the various places and in, in courses I've taught. Uh -huh. And they differ significantly, but um, basically it, it all brings people together. Sort of and I told you about yeah. the, the, the recent innovation in Japan with the bar with no seats. Yeah. And uh, that is because the Japanese are a fairly shy people. Now, <clears throat> we noticed long ago that uh, in, the, in the average American tavern, if middle class couple people came in, they sat in a booth. Uh, it was usually the working class that was felt free to go to the to bar, stand at the bar, sit on the stools, and so on. But when you sit in a booth, you've marked out your area of privacy, and pe a lot of people felt more comfortable with that. In Japan, when you sit somewhere, everybody expects that you are to be left alone, and so there's not much mixing and, and uh, meeting people mm -hmm. you don't know. But if you take away all the seating, works quite well. They, they move about as much as we do in cocktail yeah. parties. Yeah. Then there's the owner, isn't there? The wait staff or the bartender. These people make a big difference, don't they? Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking of uh, Lynn Bro and, and her cafe in D.C., her bar in D.C. Uh, she was it. She, she, for a while, they, they, she had a nude painting of her, <laughs> 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 and she, she, I don't know why it changed her mind, but she took that down, and nobody can see it anymore. <laughs> but Lynn, Lynn was a character, and uh, Hutchins, you remember Hutchins? No. He died recently. Uh, Christopher Hutchins. Hitchin. Oh yes, Hitchin, yes. Not Hutchins. Hitchin. Yes. He had his own special chair in that in that oh. bar, and uh, of course, a lot of um, congressional people stopped there, mm -hmm. and, and, and so it was a good place for uh, for a lot of banter and so on. Uh, tuna cliffs or tuna cliffs, I think it was pronounced tuna cliffs. Next, across the street from the market, and not really in a good part of town, mm -hmm. but that didn't stop the uh, mm -hmm. the regulars. They loved it. That well, issue. it's 11 hour days after 11 hour days after 11 hour days. And then if the landlord gets a little greedy and the government imposes, to my mind, oftentimes silly restrictions, it just gets to be too much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but a um, lot, lot of people go into that with, with a real desire to create this kind of place. Mm -hmm. And they do it. but. Uh, it wears on them. And how about the role of regulars in creating a third place? I've met some of your friends who are regulars. Well, the regulars determine what kind of place it is. And uh, usually regulars are always receptible, receptive to having another member. And what they have discovered is that uh, the variety adds spice. It, it, it certainly does. 
There was uh, a, a good friend of mine opened a uh, a cafe on uh, Cervantes next to the uh, where they parked the old locomotive for uh, historic effect, and a Starbucks employee came in there one day and told them everything that was wrong with their place. The chairs were too comfortable, they spent too much time talking to the customers, they uh, waited on people uh, slowly, and, and, and all of these things that we, you know, antithetical to a fast turnover. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> everything they were doing, they were doing very intently, and, and they, right. they didn't want to be like that. You know. You've told me that living in Pensacola is what prompted you to write The Great Good Place. And that's where we are now, of course, sitting in the saloon you built in your garage. Oh, well, of course, I'm antique now. And so a lot of my friends, uh, they, they either become infirm or they pass on. And uh, so the old gang is gone in a lot <laughs> of cases. But uh, I'm less tolerant of... Um, of bars, for example, than I used to be, and I'm certainly less tolerant of restaurants than I used to be. If I find a good place, I over, I over tip, I go regularly, blah blah blah. And but uh, of course, the reason that I have my own <coughs> saloon uh, is for that very reason. Mm -hmm. I, people are glad to come over. My brother-in-law loves to come over. He gets a feeling that he's getting things free here. <laughs> he loves that. <laughs> but uh, Pensacola, of course, is what prompted the book, because I had never lived in C. And, uh, I taught, uh, at, uh, taught a little bit at the University of Minnesota, and we, we had seven corners there, and that was a wonderful place within easy walking distance of social science towers. And, and I knew a lot of those people that ran those places. And that, that was great. I could have stayed in graduate school forever. That was wonderful. Then I uh, went over and taught in Wisconsin uh, in Menominee, uh, interesting county. Uh, uh, lowest capital, lowest average income, highest per capita savings all the kind of dancing was not allowed, but um, right across from the college was this wonderful, wonderful bar that served food. And I'd go over there quite often. And when they, their young son came home from school, he'd sit at the organ and knock out a tune or two. And uh, and my chairman uh, enjoyed a, uh, a a little uh, nip now and then, so. Uh, I was happy there and had a wonderful cabin on the winterized cabin on the Red Cedar River. Went to there from the, from there the University of uh, Nevada North Campus in Reno. Two blocks I, I rented two blocks from the campus, and it was four blocks downtown. The uh, so the uh, casinos entertained me and, and a lot of a lot of people on campus I knew. Uh -huh. Then I got here, and I, my first experience living in a lifeless subdivision. Took a chair out one day and sat in the front courtyard and stared at this emptiness. And I realized something was very, very wrong. This is not the way to, for people to live. Privacy is the, that's, that, that's what we have. We have privacy. And, uh, That'll drive me nuts. Um, so anyway, I, I, I got into the whole idea of there's no place to go. What what can be the, so so I, I, that that gave me the idea of the third place mm -hmm. beyond home and work. There mm -hmm. there must be some mm -hmm. kind of a third place. And then I began to look at it. Thank, thankfully, I had spent those two years in France, so I was well aware that other cultures mm -hmm. have them and have them to a far better degree than we do. And, and uh, that prompted me to look at a lot of places I had never visited, but with, you know, a lot, mm -hmm. lot of information. And you decided to write The Great Good Place. It, it's, it's in three parts. The first part, as you know, is, is what, what is it? 
and uh, the second part is it gives the uh, examples around the world. Of course, I couldn't do much with Asia because there wasn't that much information there. And the third, the third part is has to do with uh, problems related to. Um, uh, I discovered that editors ha have an idea about how long your book should be, and it shouldn't be any longer, and, and so I, I didn't write about the elderly, I didn't write about teens. There were a lot of things that should have been covered mm -hmm. that, that really weren't. But um, anyway, I got, I got that out. It was, it was so important to me, I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote till I knew I couldn't improve it, and that meant eight rewritings and about eight years to do it. So. Uh, and it isn't typical sociology because it isn't right for sociologists. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted people to read it who could do things. Who were you writing the book for? Who did you hope would read it? I was thinking about city planners, but my hopes for those for that particular profession are, are uh, it's troubling. Mm -hmm. But architects, mm -hmm. See, once, once you get architects thinking beyond an individual building, but thinking in a, in a wider vision, uh, and of course they've been my major fans. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so that was it, and then uh, I just was thinking about, well, where do I go from here? That was fun. But I got s s so much, so many people contacting me, so much tied to that. I never got beyond it, really. So I, I put together a reader. Uh, I wanted to call it Third Place Victories, but a publisher wanted to call it uh, Celebrating in Third Place, so that's what it became. But now, of course, you've had a fair amount of time to reflect on it. What else would you want to include in the new edition? What else would you want to include in the book? Well, as, as, I, as I indicated, uh, I, I, I think the uh, once you get beyond small town life, and, and uh, it, you see, small towns have a wonderful capacity to, to bring children along, you know, through all the years, and, and uh, subdivisions, um, we would have nephews come with their parents and stay, and they would go in our house and go nuts. Two days here, and they can't wait to get out. There's no luck. There's nothing uh -huh. for them, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, so I, I think a lot about teenagers, and and, uh, and and that should have been covered. The the elderly just just I thought deserved a chapter. Ray, you have teenage grandchildren now. That must give you some ideas. Well, they have. They're all boys, first of all. Mm -hmm. And the youngest two have a dad. I've given them some firearms, and he's got them shooting, and he takes them fishing, and he does a lot with them. So they have a tremendous advantage simply with their father. Mm -hmm. And then, of, of course, their mom, she's a soccer mom, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And uh, the older one's uh, <clears throat> very, very good mother. and. Uh, the oldest one is, of course, uh, is, is into girls now. So I, I, I think they could have had a much better childhood, uh, of course, as, as almost all American teenagers could nowadays if, if, we, had, uh, if we hadn't created such a, uh, an awful environment. This is another of the zoning issues we've been talking about, isn't it? Single-use zoning is... It's the worst idea I can imagine. So you were saying that you felt that the, the real, it all began with the zoning. Yeah, Supreme Court, Euclid, case of Euclid against, Euclid, Euclid, Ohio against a developer whose name I can't remember right now, but in 1926 the Supreme Court decreed single-use zoning. And you always wonder these days, since, since I'm so s suspicious of corporate influence, <clears throat> you see, once you get single-use zoning, you know, now you got a developer comes along, buys buys a huge parcel of land, mm -hmm. throws up cookie cup, uh, cook, cook, cookie cutter houses, sells them as a quick return on his investment. Now, when you build a real city with uh, 
Joe Riley, uh, mayor of Charleston, put it well. He said, uh, the, the key is to have the maximum variety and the minimal space. That takes a lot of planning, and you don't get a quick return on your investment. Mm -hmm. But when you start throwing up subdivision tracks, uh, you get a quick return mm -hmm. on your investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think back to the French communities that I visited when I was over there. If you ask how many cafes in that town, you would simply say how many blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, place on the corner. In, sub in suburbia, the place on the corner is simply another private residence. And as our friend from Norway says, gee, you people have to get in the car for everything. So, uh, Supreme Court has not been our friend. General Motors has not been our friend. Single-handedly destroying 41 trolley systems. Trolley systems begat community. Two blocks on either side of the rail, there was community, neighborhoods. So. Uh, I have a geographer uh, friend mm -hmm. in uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, spent a years trying to figure out how you remedy, how you enliven uh, a subdivision, a suburban tract. And the problem, of course, is even if you were allowed to put a place, a little place on the corner now, the population is too sparse around it. Mm -hmm. We learned years and years ago, we learned that uh, for a, a neighborhood tavern, for example, 80% of the uh, clientele came from within a two block radius. Uh -huh. That won't get you very many people in a, in a subdivision now. So sprawl plus sprawl plus single use zoning is, is deadly. It's, it's hard to overcome. What about people mixing, Ray? talking to people who aren't just like them. When I first came to Pensacola, I was in this home-to-work shuttle, and it was driving me nuts. Uh -huh. But I would, I would drive to Davis, take Creighton down to Davis, and I, I kept looking to the left, and there was this bakery with a lot of plate glass windows. And I, I noticed the same guys sitting there every day, and so I thought, I'm going to try it. And I thought, well, you know, here I am, a, uh, a young professor, and these guys are probably in the main working men. And, you know, w once you come down here, you hear the term redneck if you haven't heard it mm -hmm. before. And, oh, God, I, I, I don't know exactly what that means. It doesn't sound too good. Three visits, three visits, and I was in solid. Mm -hmm. And, my gosh, the, the variety of people. And there was a guy in the crowd they nobody liked, and but it didn't disrupt anything. He, he was he was a, a what you call a jerk, but uh, it, it it struck me. And then um, we were always we then we were we. we were always willing to accept others. And then there there were a couple of people that used to enjoy sitting there, like sitting by the fire, but not doing anything. They never talked. Uh -huh. But they'd smile at us and, and made their day too, just just kind of being mm -hmm. there. You know, some people have a real hard time joining in the mixed discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that helped. That helped immensely. That uh, unfortunately didn't last. But well, if you go at seven, the place is yours. Uh -huh. Eight o'clock, it starts to get crowded. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. You go at seven, and since there aren't many people there, they, they make special accommodations mm -hmm. for you, and it works works quite well. Mm -hmm. you know. And you know, old fogies like me, we we tend to rise early. And, <laughs> and, and that's just fine with us. Right. That was a great group. Great, I say, because of the incredible number of occupations there. Uh -huh. yeah. How often did you usually go there? Well, um, you might not see. You might not see much on Sunday, mm -hmm. but every other day. Uh -huh. <clears throat> As I told you, there's a convenience store on Johnson Avenue here in town. A bunch of guys get together, and there's no place to sit down. They don't mind that.
very much. Really. Uh -huh. Do people stand around on the street here talking? I've seen that in Italy, groups just standing on the street talking for ages, like it's something they do every day. No, not like in San Francisco. I, I noticed, I was quite fascinated to see uh, a, a bunch of guys standing in a, I don't know what you call it, it wasn't a park, it was very small, halfway up one of the hills, and there were about eight of them there, fairly well-dressed guys just standing there talking. This video was taken on the fly in the spring of 2012. It was filed away and forgotten for over a decade. Just a couple of weeks after I found it, in October 2022, Ray Oldenburg died at the age of 90. It's now up to us to carry on his work, restoring and creating the special places that bring us together, get us talking, and bring joy to the world. This is work for every one of us, so please give a thumbs up to this video, leave a comment, and join us at our Third Places community on Substack.